Good morning, everyone. I'm going to give you a, a, a quick gallop through um, suffrage, women and nationalism, and something about the impact of the Great War on lives, particularly uh, on women's lives. So before 1916, I need to go back a couple of years to remind you that women had been fighting for the right to be citizens in a new Ireland. A Home Rule Bill was now on the statute book in 1916, supposedly to come into operation at the end of the war, but women were still not going to be citizens in an independent Ireland. They were not going to get the vote. So 27 women had gone to jail between 1912 and 1914 because of their militant actions. And war split the suffrage movement. It came as a devastation in 1914. In England, the Pankhurst supported the war effort and worked with the government to encourage women to take up war work, to hand out white feathers to those men who didn't enlist. In Ireland, there were women who supported the war effort, but there was a substantial number who didn't. The militant organisation, the Irish Women's Franchise League, put out a headline, Votes for Women Now, Damn Your War, and they said our task is to preach peace, sanity and suffrage. Meg Connery, uh, a Dublin-based suffragist, said, The European war has done nothing to alter our condition of slavery. It's only served to make us realise more deeply and poignantly than ever the utter helplessness and defencelessness of our position as political outcasts in attempting to stem this tide of masculine aggression and brute force. And Margaret McCubrey, a Belfast suffragette from the Ormer Road, she said, a mother looking down the battlefield would not see so many Germans, so many British or French but so many mother's sons. And she actually established a really strong pacifist movement. Um, and she helped to smuggle men who were evading conscription in England over to Ireland. Um, and very involved in 1916, 1917 in the Women's Peace Crusade, which was an attempt to link working class women with the um, suffrage and anti-war movement. It started in Glasgow, but it did have a very small um, movement here. It didn't have very much support. There was also an international feminist movement that met at a peace congress at The Hague in 1915. Irish women were supposed to go there, but the British government closed the North Sea to shipping and the British and Irish women couldn't get to it. But that was really the establishment of what they wanted as continuous mediation, principles that actually were adopted eventually into the League of Nations. Women who supported the war or felt that they should at least have some kinds of relief work uh, at this time were, for example, Dora Malone from Warren Point. She said, we had to serve suffrage in a new way with the nation now in dire peril. Lady Aberdeen, the uh, wife of the Viceroy of Ireland, she organised a suffrage emergency council that was north and south, and Dora Malone from the north was one of those on it. They helped Belgian refugees who came over to Ireland. They supported the Red Cross. And in 1915, Dora Malone organised the Belfast Suffrage Society in having a public meeting in the Central Hall in Rosemary Street to set up an Irish fund to raise money for the Scottish women's hospitals. And they had set up hospitals in France and Serbia. This was an initiative by Scottish suffragists. They went to the British government to say they were doing this, and the British government said they weren't interested in it. So the feminist movement themselves raised that the funding to support those hospitals. Other suffragists raised funds for ambulances to send to France to fund hospital beds in Ireland for wounded soldiers. Of course, we also have um, nationalist women becoming extremely active at this time. You had the whole home rule crisis, the formation of the Irish volunteers in 1913, and the following year you have the formation of Cumann the Irish Women's Council. There is a support group for the Irish volunteers. In Belfast you have a very active branch of Cumann with James Connolly's daughters, uh, Winifred Carney who was working for the Irish Women Textile Union, and other women part of Belfast Cumann Amman. And their aims were to advance the cause of Irish liberty, 
to organise Irish women in furtherance of the object, to assist in arming and equipping a body of Irish men for the defence of Ireland, and to form a fund for these purposes. And in those early days, there was controversy over whether or not the volunteer movement supported votes for women. They refused to state a position on this because they didn't want to split the ranks. And so women didn't have um, the prospect of women's equality at that time within the nationalist movement. And the suffragists were um, used to jibe at them that their role was simply to collect money for the men to spend and to roll bandages without having any prospect of citizenship. So what makes a huge difference to women is Easter 1916 and the proclamation, because the proclamation now promised votes to women and men, and it committed the revolutionaries to the principles of equal citizenship and equality of opportunity. The suffragist Hannah Sheehy's Geffington said, it was the first time in history that men fighting for freedom voluntarily included women. And she made the point that the American War of Independence and the French Revolution, both big movements of liberation and anti-colonialism, had not included women, even though women had tried to be included. And so she felt that it was important for people to see that Ireland, as a small nation, had done something that nobody else had done. It would be the year after that the, French, uh, that the Russian Revolution took place. <coughs> And during the rising, women organised as Kumanaman field hospitals. They looked after the wounded. They cooked in very difficult circumstances. They acted as dispatch carriers. They delivered food to garrisons. There were also women in the Irish Citizen Army, commanded by James Connolly, that had women and men on a much more equal footing there. Margaret Skinner and Constance Markovich, as Citizen Army women, undertook military roles and Margaret Skinner was wounded. And Winifred Carney from Belfast was in the GPO with Connolly, the typist with the Webley, as she was called, um, uh, typing up the dispatches from headquarters. It's hard to tell how many women took part in the rising. 77 were imprisoned afterwards, but many had already left the garrisons. It felt, it's felt that there could have been 200 women out of an estimated total of 1,600 people involved in the rising. And after that watershed, Cumberland felt free to include a new aim in their constitution. They now were following the policy of the Republican proclamation by seeing that women take up their proper position in the life of the nation. And now funds to be collected were to be for the arming and equipping of the men and women of Ireland. And women become much more vocal in organising for equality within Sinn Féin and arguing that women ought to by right be on the executive of Sinn Féin. But what about the general population of women at this time who were not politically involved? The Great War was on a total scale. It involved entire populations of the nations involved. There was therefore a battlefront and a home front, and huge pressure on women to support the uh, war effort. In many ways, the war presented women with new opportunities for work, for voluntary activity, for volunteering to work abroad as a nurse or nursing auxiliary, but many of those gains were short-lived. For working class women, war meant additional burdens of looking after the family, of the uncertainty of wondering if their husbands or, or um, fathers were, were in the army or the navy, would they get the separation allowance that would keep them and their families? And if it was paid, could they stretch it to cover their needs? And they also had to undergo state scrutiny to make sure they were re fit recipients, that they didn't drink the allowance. Um, in the early months of the war, legislation was brought in to regulate the opening hours of public houses for the first time ever. So war affected every aspect of people's lives. Food prices rose, shipping stopped the importation of supplies, um, tillage became much more important. There was huge scarcities and women were the ones in the home trying to keep everything together. In war work, they were paid less than men. Sylvia Pankhurst, who didn't support the war, unlike her mother and sisters, came over to Belfast campaigning for equal pay for women at this time and for better conditions for working women. 
Mackies took middle-class women as unpaid volunteers, and we didn't have in the North that tradition of the munitionettes, of the women working in the munitions factories, which you did have in Dublin, and obviously you had across the water. But what you do see is employers taking advantage of having women as substitutes for male employees, hoping that they can cut costs by paying the women less. In the linen industry, um, the flax supplies were, were badly affected, and you found that the employers were putting women on short-term working at this time, cutting the rates that they were paying women. There was actually a, a small strike of women workers in the linen industry in 1916. Military nursing was also important. A lot of unskilled women now joined the voluntary aid detachments, the VADs, and in Ireland, 4,500 4 women became VADs and were able to serve either in Ireland or abroad. At first, women doctors weren't allowed on the front, but by mid-1916, the need for doctors on the Western Front was so great that women were actively recruited for hospitals. And Dr Elizabeth Bell, the first woman to qualify as a doctor in Ireland, a Belfast suffragette who'd served time in Holloway Jail when she went over to support the campaign there, she was one of the doctors who worked for the war effort in Malta. Irish Moss was vital to the war work and care for the injured. It was a very superior and absorbent dressing. And in Ireland, we have 17 species and 25 varieties of sphagnum moss. And you can see photos of women dressed in white, collecting the moss, drying it and making it into dressings and sending it for distribution to allied hospitals. In July 1915, Edith, the seventh Marchioness of Londonderry, an aristocrat, a feminist and a unionist, organised the Women's Legion. Women were wanting to get involved in war work in a number of ways, and what she said was this would allow women to do their duties as women and not as makeshift men. It became the first women's voluntary organisation to be accepted for military service, and in 1917, the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps developed from her initiative of the Women's Legion. The Women's Land Army also developed from this. Again, mainly middle-class single women now working on the land. In terms of supporting the... Um, wives of soldiers and sailors, there was a Women's United Service Club. The presidents were Lady Jellicoe and Lady French, but they formed branches in the north. And there was a branch formed for the Falls and Smithfield electoral wards using the St. Vincent de Paul rooms. They had sewing and knitting classes, and you can see through that, in terms of the social welfare, that Protestant and Catholic women were both equally in need and were involved in this. And finally, a lot of the work of women, and you look at the newspapers of the time, seems to have gone into fundraising. And this seems to have been a huge outlet, particularly for middle-class women. There were all sorts of appeals. The Queen Mary appeal, the Prince of Wales National Relief Fund, the Cull Relief Fund, the Lord and Lady Mayor of Belfast, very involved in that kind of fundraising. Women were knitting for the troops, collecting money and sending cigarettes endless supplies of cigarettes sent to the troops on the front. An English woman in Belfast writing in her diary in March 1916 talked about a suicide in Albertville Drive. She said a very decent woman with a family was there and it got on her mind about her sons being in the trenches and one morning she went down early to get breakfast before her daughter went to work and they came down at six o'clock in the morning and there she lay dead in the kitchen with her throat cut. And the cleaners said, oh, yes, the very same has just happened in our street. So the English woman said, I'm all for cinemas and socials now and anything to quieten people's nerves. And it's remarkable when you look at the papers and you see the casualty lists getting longer and longer, what that was like. But you also start to see suicides reported in the papers, particularly of women. Um, so it was a very bit difficult times for all women, and you can see popular culture arising at the same time, trying to keep the morale of the nation um, at this time. Okay, thank you.